Hello and welcome to Gimme 5, I'm Jack. An action-packed episode today, starting things off with Carmel Valley, the Carmel Valley Fiesta. This year, we're gonna meet a couple of guys who show their cars there. We'll even meet a gentleman who is known as the Bean Guy, who has all the history of more than just beans. The Monterey Arts Council and Paulette Lynch feature the artwork of Monterey High School students. We'll tell you what you need to know about broadcast transmission and towers from our very own Jim Newsom. We'll find out what it's like to be an orthodontist with Dr. West, and we'll start things off with the Fort Ord National Monument. It's in our own backyard. Let's go check it out. This is the Fort Ord National Monument. You'll find the entrance to it across the street from the Toro Cafe on Highway 68 between Salinas and Monterey. What is a national monument? National monuments are designated to protect objects of scientific and historic interest by public proclamation by the President of the United States as authorized by the Antiquities Act of 1906. Monuments are also created by Congress through legislation. What are the benefits of a national monument? The primary benefit of national monument status is to ensure continued protection of Fort Ord's unique natural and cultural resources. This national designation attracts the attention of not only the visiting public Public, but also federal and state agencies, private organizations and schools and universities interested in environmental education or research opportunities. Due to the unusually high number of sensitive species, there is much to be learned within the Fort Ord National Monument and this information can ultimately be applied in other areas. The designation as a national monument elevates this unique natural area into a national system designed to identify and protect such values. Fort Ord was a U.S. Army post established in 1917 as a maneuver area and a field artillery target range. It was closed in 1994. In April of 2012, President Obama signed a proclamation to designate the Fort Ord National Monument. The President stated that the protection of the Fort Ord area will maintain its historical and cultural significance, attract tourists and recreationalists from near and far, and enhance its unique natural resources for the enjoyment of all Americans. It holds some of the last undeveloped natural wildlands on the Monterey Peninsula, with over 7,000 acres of wilderness, 35 species of rare plants and animals along with their native coastal habitats. It's open every day from dawn to dusk for hikers, mountain bikers, horseback riders, photographers, and nature enthusiasts. You can choose to walk or ride the narrow single track trail atop the grassland hill or the generous winding trails through oak woodlands and maritime chaparral. On a cool morning, you could catch a glimpse of a badger, mountain lion, or golden eagle. Maybe you'll see a black-tailed deer, turkeys, bobcats, coyotes, gopher snakes, red-tailed hawks, Canadian geese, coast horned lizards, or California quail. The area plays a vital part in the protection of rare species of plants and animals. Many of the rare plants in the former Fort Ord military base have 50 to 90 percent of their worldwide habitat right here. Now, let's travel about 13 miles south of the Fort Ord National Monument to a lovely little community called Carmel Valley. It's the annual Carmel Valley Fiesta every August for fun, food, and beans. We are here with Bruce Nichols of the Carmel Valley Fiesta, and you're an old-timer here, and they call you the Bean Guy. Well, they, I just got the Bean Guy this year. That, I mean, you have to be at least 75 years old in order to do beans. Okay. So, yeah. And you're in. I'm in. Just in. Yeah. Okay. Well, you have some history about this Carmel Valley Fiesta. There was like a pig roast or something, how it all started. What's the story? It all, it all started out, let's see, 93 or 94, when the chairman of the Fiestas asked me if I would find something to do on Friday night as a kickoff. And, you know, he said, how about a concert or something like that? And I happened to be in the, in the Mucky Duck listening to a couple of friends who had talked about having a backyard barbecue with some wild boar and I said that sounds pretty interesting how'd you like to you know cook some wild boar for a couple hundred people out in Carmel Valley and they said we'd love it so that was kind of the idea that as it started so we went out and we acquired some hunters that uh, could harvest some wild boar up at the preserve uh, 
it was almost before the preserve, you know, but the, uh, we had uh, about 10 wild boars and a couple of domestic pigs. We had no idea whatsoever how many people would attend. We started advertising by putting in the Pine Co and the Herald and so on, and, and at the time the Carmel Valley Sun, with just ads saying, you know, what is a hoopla? And with no definition whatsoever. And we ran that ad for a couple, three weeks. And then finally we said, who stands for wild pig and pla stands for party. And th then we tried to sell tickets for about $20. And uh, uh, on the night of the event, we had bought food and had pigs to serve about 200 people. We had sold at that point about 20 tickets. And we looked up and cars kept coming in, coming in, coming in. And before it was all done, we had about 300 people here. And, you know, the, the event was born. And since that time, it has really been dedicated to providing funds for scholarships. The, the second year, we added the, the silent auction idea as an enhancement. And I would guess over the years we've probably raised maybe 120 to 150 thousand dollars with the event, and and we we went away from the wild boar thing after about three years, because the the truth of the matter is wild boar is really not that tasty, and the uh, we always had a wild boar uh, cooked on a spit or in a barbecue pit, and. The fire department said, we just don't like the fire pit anymore. You can do a spit, and that's okay. But the truth of the matter was, people weren't just crazy about eating wild boar. And so the menu turned into something else. But the party just grew and grew. And we'll probably serve five or 600 people tonight. And I'm glad to get a bit, a bit of that history from you. It's a kind of eye-opener. It's fine. We're going to see you around with uh, your beans later. Well, okay. <laughs> They're going to be the best beans ever. I, this year we have a secret ingredient. I guess you're not telling me. Are you? No. <laughs> That's Bruce. I have to kill you. Okay, you'd have to kill me. Bruce the bean guy will be uh, checking out his beans later. We're here with JJ from Monterey, and he has a beautiful car. JJ, tell us about it. Well, it's a 69 Buick Riviera, and I bought it brand new in 1969. And uh, I had it painted once before. I had It used to be charcoal gray with a black vinyl top, and I... About 10, 15 years ago, I changed it to black, all black. And about five years ago, I had it redone again, took off the door handle, had everything uh, shaved off it, and uh, and had it painted this color. It's and, beautiful. Thank you. But I had it all this time. and I, One owner. One owner, that's it. You're hanging on to it. That's right, definitely hanging on to it. Yeah, right on. Well, thanks for telling us about your car. Thank you. We're here with Vern. Vern, you're a local guy. Yes, I was born and raised in the city of Pacific Grove. I've been here all my life, 73 years. Excellent. We're here, here we are at the Fiesta, a beautiful day in Carmel Valley, and this is your car. Yes, it is. It's a 1955 Chevrolet. It uh, originally was a six-cylinder with a three-speed, and now it's a V8 with a four-speed, so it had to have a little more power. <laughs> How long you had this? Oh, about four or five years now. I bought it partially done and finished it. Is your passion? Yeah, sort of. I was a mechanic for the city of Pacific Grove for 35 years before I retired, so I've always loved the old cars. Excellent. Well, it looks like a mighty powerful machine. Well, it uh, gets down the road pretty good. It keeps up with the uh, Volkswagens and stuff. <laughs> Excellent. And is this your first time here at the Fiesta? Oh, I've been I've been here about four times now, and uh, it, it's a great show. Larry Barber puts it on for the Kiwanis down here, and it, it's a really a nice place to come. It's not as sunny as it normally is. But it's it's nice. Works for me. Yeah, it works for me too. <laughs> well, hey, good luck on showing your car today. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Vern. The Arts Council for Monterey is doing something they've never done before. Let's check in with Paulette Lynch to see what's going on. I'm Paulette Lynch, and I'm here at the Arts Council for Monterey County in our wonderful gallery. We are hosting for the first time ever Monterey High School. They're our very very first uh, uh, exhibition for our teen series. Where every year. We're going to choose a different high school to feature their wonderful work in a special exhibition. 
So this is the very first time doing it, and we're really happy to be able to do that. Uh, for this particular show, these are kids that have been working through their art uh, at the school for, for several years. The Arts Council mission is to improve the quality of life for everyone in our region through the arts. And we find over and over again that the arts are the answer to creating just a more vibrant, healthier community. And this kind of exhibition, seeing the student work like this in a community setting, is a great example. Um, I did, these are sunset moths, and I did these because my concentration for my AP art class was um, insects, and I like to do things that are like a little more unconventional, so I decided to do moths instead of butterflies, and I thought these were pretty, so I chose these <laughs> to do. This is an acrylic painting. Um, it's a print of it, but the original is acrylic. <laughs> this one was a um, assignment for, our teacher had photos from the Jazz Festival, and so this was a picture of, um, it was actually a full picture of the guy, but we, our assignment was to zoom in on one piece, and I thought the hands were, were really cool, so I chose to do those. <laughs> I definitely want to go into the arts. Um, I really, I'm looking, I really want to be an illustrator, and hopefully my art will take me closer to that. <laughs> I did this one because um, I like fireflies, and I thought this was, I like doing close-ups, um, so I liked that this was a close-up more of the face. Um, and then this one, I like doing different like themes with them, and so the theme for this one was kind of like the feeling of being alone. So I decided to do a ladybug with, you know, kind of nothing around it besides leaves because he's alone. <laughs> well, right now the, this print is going for 55, and I think that's a good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sierra Winters, and this is my artwork. I took it at the Monterey Hot or the Monterey Fairgrounds during the fair of this year. And then I had put in um, a broken glass texture over it. I just look for what's nice. I like, I like doing nature and landscapes, and I love to travel and take pictures also. Ultimately, I would love to be a photographer. I think art is really important in school. We should have it more often, because I'm, I'm part of the art academy in school, and it's really fun. And just arts is really, really good. Um, well, we were lucky to be chosen for the first art exhibition for the Arts Council Monterey County. And um, our high school was chosen randomly and um, just really excited to be part of the show. So we have some of our photography students, some of our AP art students featured. I think we have about 16 artists total. I went and I looked at my, my top students, my AP students, and I tried to pick students who I knew needed to have you know, a little bit more show. Some of them have already shown in a few different art shows this spring. So we tried to kind of round out the group. Um, also tried to pick work that would relate well to Monterey County and, you know, to a wide audience. I knew the work would be on sale, so trying to pick art that I thought would probably be a little bit more saleable. This is a great opportunity. Very rarely is student work on sale like this. And then some of the money is going back to the students and some of the money is going back to the Arts Council. So if you're buying a piece at this show, all of the money is going to be helping kids. So that's great. If you're watching this channel, then you're an educated person and you're a well-rounded person. And you know how critical it is for brain development to be studying art and music um, for, from elementary school on through high school. So just to really push to see the art come back into elementary schools, because I... It's sad, but a lot of students I, I get as a freshman have never made art before. Maybe they've made a project here and there. They have no idea what color wheel is. They've only worked with pencils. They've never done anything with paint. And I find that so sad. So I have to catch them up quite a bit. So the more we can bring art into the elementary, into the middle schools, I think that's going to help with high school. And keeping these kids motivated to want to learn and want to be part of our making world. And one more thing, I just want to add that um, most of these students are from the Art Careers Academy at Monterey High School. And we're an academy that's been around since 1996. We're making a move to go digital in this last, um, last this year and next year. Um, and really pushing to get more students involved in the academy. And it's a great opportunity for students to be involved with uh, careers, partnership with community members and artists. And this kind of professional show is what the Art Academy is all about. Thanks so much for seeing our ex exhibit today. Uh, we're just really excited to present this. If you want to find out more information, get more involved, then please come to our website. It's artsformc.org. Now, here's a segment you can really sink your teeth into. Brace yourself. Hi, I'm Dr. Barbara West, and I'm an orthodontist. 
Usually, the American Dental Association asks parents to bring their children to the dentist, the family dentist, at about one year of age when they're first starting to get their baby teeth growing into their mouth. And the American Association of Orthodontists recommends that you take your child for, its first, for his or her first orthodontic visit at age seven, just as the permanent teeth are starting to erupt in, in the mouth to be able to assess if there are any potentially damaging problems developing. Most likely, the orthodontist is going to take a watch and wait and kind of reevaluate kind of point of view. But if there are certain problems noted that can be serious, then there's a kind of treatment called phase one where it's very limited and it addresses certain serious issues. Uh, perhaps upper incisors, upper front teeth sticking out so far that they could be fractured or broken off very easily. Sometimes cross bites in the back where the child can't close their teeth normally and they have to c continually shift their jaw to the side. Um, sometimes crowding that's so severe that some of the gum tissue is being lost on the front surfaces of the teeth. So if a serious condition is um, determined, then this phase one treatment can be started. It's usually limited and lasts only about a year and can head off issues. It can involve partial braces, it can involve removable appliances, it can involve palatal expanders, any number of things. And sometimes the orthodontist will just guide the occlusion by um, extraction of certain baby teeth to let certain permanent teeth come into correct spots. So it's, it's very varied um, and usually that initial evaluation takes place at about age seven or so, or should. Most orthodontic treatment on teenagers occurs between the ages of 11 and 13, 14, somewhere in that time frame. But now more and more adults are receiving orthodontic treatment as well. And my oldest patient was actually 76 years of age. But you know, it's very common in, for adults in their 20s and 30s to, if they never had a chance to have braces in their youth and now finally they can manage it, that they would start having some orthodontics as well. So we're treating the little kids and we're treating the adults and the teenagers, which were the traditional group of patients that were treated in previous years. We talked previously about the early treatment or the phase one treatment maybe lasting a year or less, but very typically regular orthodontic treatment is about two years, maybe a little less to a little more, but usually you estimate about two years. If it's a severe case, it might go two and a half. You know, if it's fairly straightforward, it might be a year to 18 months. The very first thing that people see when they first meet you, or if they know you and they're seeing you again, the very first thing they see is, is you smiling, hopefully. And if a person feels bad about how they, they look when they smile, not everyone, but a lot of people have a, a little less self-esteem and they're feeling a little less comfortable about smiling. And so if you can do anything to improve self-confidence and self-esteem, that's, that's so important. And of course, there's always a traditional reason to, to get orthodontics is for the health of your, your teeth and your jaws because extremely crowded teeth can lead to difficulty with keeping parts of your mouth clean, which can lead in turn to periodontal disease, um, can lead to early tooth loss with extreme periodontal disease. And now, now they're finding um, more results that, you know, that your general overall oral health is related to your overall physical health. And they're making more and more connections between problems with the oral health and problems um, with the general body health. So. Uh, Doing orthodontics for looking cool is important, but also uh, for the health of your, your teeth and your body. They're actually now, they're little tiny brackets and they are little squares with a little slot that runs through the square and they're directly glued onto every tooth. But you can see how this wire is displaced tooth to tooth to tooth. And this is a really light wire and many orthodontists start with a wire that's uh, made of nickel titanium. It's super flexible, causes very little discomfort, and it just gradually puts a little pressure on the teeth, and slowly, slowly the teeth align. And then you'll change to another wire size and so forth. And in this case, this particular study model had two bicuspids extracted. So those are the sort of smaller side teeth. And you can just imagine how you can guide this canine tooth now do a view from the front. Gradually guide that canine tooth down into that spot where the extraction was done and then everything can become aligned and fit together really well. They need to wear a retainer for a couple of years for sure. You know, usually we have them wear a retainer full time for six months and then at night 
for uh, several years. Things that you think about are whether the patient's finished growing, whether the wisdom teeth have erupted yet, um, and in general, um, how stable are they? Gradually, you go through a program of just weaning the patient off the retainers. If you want to be extra safe and sure, leaving the retainers on or wearing retainers at night for as long as possible is always a really good idea. And in adults, usually uh, most orthodontists ask the adults to wear retainers maybe for the rest of their lives, especially if their teeth were really, really crowded because they always have a tendency to want to go back to where they used to be. Barbara West gets two thumbs up. You can contact Dr. West at loveyoursmile.org. That's L-U-V, yoursmile.org. Have you ever wondered about those big broadcast antennas on top of a mountaintop? Well, me neither, but now would be a good time to find out about them. Hi, my name is Jim Newsom, and my title is manager for the telecommunications sites for the MCOE McCabe Foundation. And at the same time, I do a lot of the special operation projects that are related to our operations here for Millennium Charter. The edifices on top of the mountaintops that you see that are towers are our means of connecting over the airwaves communications with regards to television signals, two-way radio signals, emergency broadcasting for public service and community services. And this is how we stream educational video to our schools, both over the internet and with over-the-air broadcasting. From our television studio here in MCOE Salinas, we go up and we spread our signals both north and south so we can reach the needs of our students, both in the classroom, for educational purposes, and for internet communications where schools don't have it or don't have as much as they would like. The whole purpose of this is to provide connectivity. This particular facility generates the venue for broadcasting, for arts, theater, educational television, but we have to have a means to transport it into the home. And the television towers, communication towers that we have on the mountaintops, and we have four of them, is our means of providing this throughout the county. Those four towers are Toro, Twin Peak, Williams Hill and School Peak up by Fremont. These towers will sit up there at least at 2,000 feet, some a little bit higher, and the towers that we're speaking of are 100 feet high. They are riddled with round little dishes that you see up there, plus television antennas, two-way radio antennas, trunking systems. This is how both the county, our school bus is tied up, this is how we provide emergency services for San Benito County for their communications, Santa Clara for Cal Fire, Santa Cruz to reach into their area over there for their school needs. So in a sense, our communication towers do a lot more than just provide services to Monterey all by itself. The goal of our communication towers in the future with the new studio operations that we're setting up is to provide distant learning and video streaming where it's needed to fill in our educational needs to the county. We have customers and clients that are standing by waiting for us to provide educational and public broadcasting to the communities that don't have this right now. As far south as Hunter Liggett, which wants educational television for their purposes as well. So you have to keep in mind the towers have a multiple purpose. Not only are we fulfilling the educational needs for our purposes in the county, but we're also playing a vital important part for civil defense and for emergency broadcast issues. We have the Monterey County Office of Emergency Services. We have the USGS for seismic awareness. And we also have the civil defense, which is the emergency broadcasting throughout the county that we would in the case of a national or a major event like an earthquake. So these are very important edifices up on these mountaintops. We serve education and we serve the community. Thank you, Jim Newsom, for all the technological insight about broadcast antennas. Well, it looks like we're just about out of time here. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please write them on a $5 bill and mail them to me. Or you can contact me at the address you see on the screen. For Gimme 5, I'm Jack Peterson. We'll see you next time.